So hello everyone, I welcome you all to the session uh, of tech, Data Technical Depth, Looking Beyond Code by Scott Ambler. So Scott, we are glad that you join us for the session and it'll be great to have the insights on the session. Thank you, over to you, Scott. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, thanks for taking time out of your busy day to uh, either attend this talk live or to uh, view it, uh, view the recording at another time. So anyways, yeah, so what I'd like to talk about is technical debt in data and databases. This is a topic that's, that's not covered very well, unfortunately. So, but we'll, uh, I'm gonna share some industry stats and uh, some uh, strategies for you today. So as you heard, my name is Scott Ambler. I'm uh, one of the co-creators of the Disponential Toolkit along with Mark Lines. I'll talk about that and share some information from that in a bit. Uh, I'm also the person behind the Agile data method, as well as the Agile modeling method. So I'm also going to talk about a few techniques that are, you know, close to 20 years old now, and, uh, you know, for addressing data quality problems. Uh, so anyway, so it'll be some interesting, um, you know, perhaps new to you, but uh, old to, uh, you know, old to me, I guess. So anyways, um, I'd like to explore the concept of data or database technical debt, depending on what you want to call it. Um, and then we're going to talk about some strategies for, you know, how do we address it? How do we avoid it? How do we, how do we actually accept sometimes that we're just going to have to learn to live with some of this debt? Um, and then I'm going to, I'll end off with a discussion of, you know, why is this hard? Um, why are we still struggling with data quality problems? Well, you just technical debt in general, but certainly uh, data technical debt, um, you know, why are we still struggling with this? It's, uh, you think we'd be able to do better, <laughs> but uh, apparently not. So anyways, uh, what's, uh, what is data technical debt? So as we know, a technical debt is, uh, is basically the accumulation of uh, poor product, uh, poor uh, quality and uh, challenges and defects. Data technical debt is, well, you know, poor quality in, uh, in our legacy data sources, our existing databases and files and good stuff like that. So um, it's just a, you know, a subset of overall technical debt. And one of the challenges is that there's many types of technical debt, many categories. And unfortunately, due to cultural challenges in the data community, um, there's not a lot of discussion of data technical debt. And even though the, you know, the stats are horrendous, um, we have some, you know, many organizations have some pretty significant challenges when it comes to uh, data technical debt. And I'll, like I said, I'll share some stats on that. So there's different types of data technical debt. And this is from an article I wrote a, a while ago now on this topic. Um, you know, we have uh, you know, some obvious ones, like the, the, the structures of our tables and columns aren't quite right. Um, you know, the, the needs have evolved over time and we haven't updated them. Uh, just basic data quality problems. There's a whole slew of things that can go wrong with data. Um, you know, lack of documentation, you know, the method and function, like a lot of the coding, uh, code oriented technical debt issues are applicable databases because there's, you know, stored procedures and stored functions and uh, triggers and um, other types of functionality implemented in the database and it's code. It's, just a, you know, it's coded in a different language, but it's still code. And uh, so there's all the opportunities that uh, for technical debt in, our, in the code that's operating the database. So um, this is a wide, you know, th there's a wide range of challenges here. So why does technical debt in general occur, you know, and, and particularly data uh, technical debt? Well, business pressures, you know, we've got to be on time and on budget. And I'll, I'll share some, uh, info, you know, I'll share some uh, research uh, stats on that in a bit. Um, lack of testing. Uh, the, the level of testing in the data world is uh, much lower than what we see uh, when it comes to unit testing or code, you know, developer level testing. Um, yeah, I'm sure many of you work in organizations where you don't even have a regression test suite for your databases. You might, and, and you might even work in organizations where they haven't even considered the concept. Um, so there's some cultural challenges there that we need to overcome. Uh, we might not be refactoring. We might not even know how to refactor databases. Um, I'll talk about that in a bit. We, you know, just a lack of knowledge, lack of, lack of skills, lack of, uh, you know, upfront thinking. Um, there's many, many reasons. Uh, lack of proper collaboration between uh, application teams and uh, you know, your data professionals in your organization. So there's a lot of reasons why uh, this technical debt occurs. So why should we care? Why is this important? Well, you know, Gartner, uh, you know, uh, they've estimated that on average, the average organization 
uh, loses $15 million per year. Now this is an average. So, you know, smaller organizations have probably have less of a loss. Larger organizations probably have significantly greater loss, right? So, you know, but anyways, um, on average, $15 million per year per organization is lost due to poor quality data. So it might be worth your while. So if you're an average organization, you're losing $15 million a year. Um, I spend a couple of bucks trying to fix those problems that was me. So what is the impact of poor quality data? Well, we have lost revenue, right? So um, the, big, the big challenge is we, we are making ineffective decisions. If we have the wrong data or we don't have access to the right data in a timely manner, then we're not making good decisions at all. Um, so our, our leadership is, is, is harmed. We might have, uh, we might damage our reputation. We're making mistakes in the marketplace where uh, we might have data loss. Uh, you know, we have like security breaches and, and stuff like that. And we might even be getting fined. Um, for those of you working in organizations where, uh, you know, uh, regulations such as GDPR are applicable, um, you know, if you have uh, some data problems, uh, the fines for, from GDPR are quite substantial. Uh, let alone if you're operating in in, in California or many other organizations, many other uh, parts of the world that have similar laws to GDPR. So there's a lot of opportunity for uh, to be impacted by poor quality data and poor quality data sources. Uh, this is another estimate. This, the, the actual true source of this is an IBM study, but this was first uh, surfaced uh, publicly or at least uh, promoted um, in a big way in, by Harvard Business Review a few years ago now. But uh, bad data is estimated to cost the United States $3 trillion a year. Uh, I suspect this number is bigger now. I can't find better stats than this, but um, actually, if you know about better stats, please email me. But uh, $3 trillion a year. So that is a reasonably big problem that we might want to address. And that's just the United States. That's not an international issue. So, you know, we could be talking, you know, 10, $15 trillion a year internationally or more. Uh, so te data technical debt, it, it impedes your, your ability to make decisions and to um, just to know what the heck is going on. Uh, it increases your operational costs. Um, I'm sure many of you, you know, for at least the developers among us, uh, you probably have to write code to do, to do data cleansing, to you know, convert data coming in from a database into whatever it is that you want, and maybe to convert it back again to you know, whatever the database is expecting. That's an overhead. That's you know, not only do we have you know, data technical debt that you're covering up basically with a Band-Aid, you, you, know, you now have code technical debt because you've got all this you know, extra you know, data cleansing code. Um, or, you know, look at the effort that goes in, you know, in the data warehousing world to cleanse data coming in and to, to fix it and make it, uh, you, know, uh, you know, better, better quality. Um, and frankly, it, it impedes your ability to react to change. Uh, you know, many people work in organizations where, you know, the developers have, have adopted agile techniques and, you know, they're quite flexible and they can, you know, evolve their systems pretty quickly, except the data. And then the data, you know, changing a production database is perceived as risky and difficult. Um, this is a problem. And I'll, I'll show you techniques to, to deal with that. But um, this is the rally on the ground that the, the databases are, are, are very often a, uh, an anchor around our necks. And it doesn't have to be that way. So I want to give you a brief introduction to Discipline Agile so that way you can understand what I'm talking about um, when I talk, start talking about, uh, when I describe how to actually fix um, and address uh, these uh, data technical debt issues in your organization. So Discipline Agile is a toolkit. It's not a framework. Um, and this is absolutely important. So where frameworks and methods tell you what to do, Discipline Agile tells you what to, to think about, what to be concerned about, and then gives you options. And this is one of the reasons why we have comprehensive uh, data techniques in the toolkit is because, well, we, you know, we care, <laughs> but uh, we, we know it's important. So we put these techniques in a context for you so that way you can choose to use them when they make sense to be used. And I'll give some examples of this in a minute. So Discman Agile is a tool is a, in a way an umbrella over hundreds of techniques. Actually, um, the toolkit right now has, has, puts about 1,600 different techniques into context. Um, so the idea is that there's all these wonderful techniques out there. And well, actually, if you look at what's going on at this conference, 
I bet you if you if somebody were to do a count of the strategies and techniques that were that are being described at this event um, happening right now, easily there's hundreds, easily. Um, and that's great, right? This is one of the reasons why you attend an event like this is to learn, you know, techniques that are new to you and, and hopefully learn how to apply them. Well, this is the reality on the ground. There's many, many, many techniques out there that you might choose to use because what you want to do is you want to choose the right techniques for the situation that you face to put together your way of working. So this is why you attend uh, training and, and conferences and good stuff like that to learn about these techniques. Well, the DA Toolkit has codified them. We've captured them and we put them into context and we provide a, a means for you to learn quickly and to choose the right ones for you. In DA, we also have a, a, a more robust mindset, I guess you would call it. Uh, so a few years ago, we moved beyond the Agile Manifesto. And, and don't get me wrong, the Agile Manifesto was great, but it's 20 years old. Uh, the Agile Manifesto, or actually more accurately, the Manifesto for Agile Software Development focused on solving the problems faced by software developers 20 years ago. Well, many of those problems are now solved in you know, most part because of the Manifesto, but um, we have new sets of issues. We have learned something. We've learned more than a few things in the last 20 years. And the scope has evolved. We're not just talking about software development anymore. We really are hopefully looking at enterprise agility. So a couple of years ago now at PMI, we stepped back and we said, you know what? If we were to rewrite the manifesto today, given what we know, how would we rework it? And this is what we came up with. So we believe in the collection of principles. And because we believe in them, we make promises both to ourselves and to the people that we, that we work with. This is how we're going to behave. In order to fulfill these promises, we follow a collection of guidelines. Now, if you take a look at this, these are mostly lean ideas. There's some agile ideas in there as well, uh, of course. Uh, and a lot, there's a lot of people-oriented stuff, as you'd expect. So we've gone beyond uh, what was in the original manifesto. So anyways, um, uh, and we're going to see... Uh, so why is this important? Well, first, I want to make you aware that uh, things have moved on, but also uh, for addressing uh, and dealing with data technical debt or technical debt in general, um, you know, some of the principles, promises, and guidelines are directly applicable. And I, I'm going to be focusing on these sorts of uh, philosophies or these sorts of ways of thinking um, th throughout the rest of this talk. The scope of Discipline Agile is the enterprise. So you'll see that um, each of these hexes, it represents what we call a process blade or process area. All of these areas, uh, you know, all these areas can have the opportunity to improve. So we can do better at software development, what we call Discipline Agile delivery. We can do better at DevOps. We can do better at portfolio management, finance, and so on. So when you start wanting to be an agile business and, and truly be an agile enterprise, you need to look at the bigger picture. You need to look far beyond IT. And so the DA toolkit uh, covers that and gives you solutions uh, or potential solutions for that. So uh, another thing about the DA toolkit, and it, I think it was clear in the mindset, is that it's a hybrid. So we adopt ideas from a wide range of sources, you know, agile, certainly agile sources, but also lean sources and even traditional sources, because there's a lot of great ideas out there. And our goal is to put them into context to describe when you would want to use them, when you would not want to use them and how they fit together. So, and we do this um, for all aspects of your, of your organizational process, not just software development. So, in this talk today, I'll be adopting ideas from enterprise architecture, or working through some ideas from enterprise architecture and governance strategies, and of course, data management strategies, as well as software development and you know, agile delivery strategies as well. So I just wanted to uh, point that out to you. So how do we avoid data technical? How can we apply the DA toolkit to you know, you know, hopefully <laughs> avoid the, the debt, debt uh, to begin with? Because the easiest debt to pay down is the debt that you never that you never took on to begin with? So this is the uh, our slight reworking of the technical debt quadrant from uh, Martin Fowler. 
Um, basically, the only reworking is um, I put the questions in the, in the context for data, technical debt. So we have different four different quadrants here. And the main lesson to be learned, we're going to see this over and over and over again in this talk, is that there's good reasons uh, to take on you know technical debt. Like if you're if you're thinking it through and you're doing it deliberately and prudently, so you're being smart about the technical debt you're taking on, and you actually explicitly accept it. You understand the implications of yes, we know we're taking on this debt. And it's a good strategy for us. This is a trade-off we're willing to make and we understand what we're doing. That's the green uh, quadrant. The two yellow quadrants are sort of iffy. Um, you know, you're taking on technical debt, but you're basically stumbling into it. Um, and then the red uh, quadrant is, you just don't know what you're doing. And sadly, it's mostly the red quadrant, I think, where a lot of technical debt, you know, at least the bad tech, the really bad technical debt gets injected. So we need to understand why this occurs. So that's why I'm, uh, talk about this, and we're gonna we're gonna map the techniques to um, uh, the quadrants over time. So one of the ways that we can avoid uh, technical debt to begin with is we need to understand the requirements. Why are we building what it is that we're building, or why are we evolving what we're evolving? Um, so, and this is a, a functional uh, requirements issue and a non-functional requirements issue too. If we build the wrong thing, well, we've just injected technical debt. We've injected functional. Uh, you know, we in, in, injected new functionality, including data that we just didn't need. Um, if we miss important non-functional requirements, well, we're injecting technical quality challenges into what we're doing. Also didn't need to do that. So um, sometimes the, our approach to requirements um, and understanding the scope of what we're supposed to be doing can have a huge impact. Um, this diagram here, I guess I should explain it um, because we're going to see these sorts of diagrams um, several times. Uh, this is the explore scope process goal diagram. So we describe team agility as a collection of, I believe, 26 process goals, uh, exploring scope being one of them. So the, in the middle, we have what we call decision points. These are issues or considerations that you need to address. And you'll be doing it either implicitly, excuse me, Excuse me. Uh, you'll do it either implicitly or, or explicitly. So when we go to explore scope, we're going to be thinking about what, what's the purpose of what it is that we're doing? How are people going to use our solution? You know, what data do we need to collect about it? What business process do we support? What quality requirements, non-functional requirements, and so on? So we're going to be, we need, we need to think through these issues. Now, the methodologies and frameworks will often um, prescribe ways of working. They'll prescribe, you know, thou shalt write user stories, for example. And they're not quite that explicit, but they're basically, um, you know, they've only got one or two techniques and they, they hammer on them. Um, okay, whatever. But we know we need more, right? So anyway, so we have options. And then on the right-hand side, well, our options, you know, potential techniques that you can use to address the issues um, in the middle. So there's two types of lists. There's an ordered list, the list with arrows. And what that indicates is that the um, strategies towards the top of the list are generally more effective in practice than the strategies towards the bottom of the list. And then there's unordered lists, no arrows. So in those lists, we can't say that this technique is generally better than this technique. All we can tell you is here's the trade-offs of these techniques. Here's the context in which you would use them. So you need to choose the right technique for you in the situation that you face. Because I don't, I can't tell you what the best practices are. There are, there is no such thing as a best practice. All practices are contextual in nature. You need to choose what's right for you. What can you, what can your team do? What do you need to do in your situation? So choose the right, you know, the best or the most appropriate strategy for you in the situation that you face. So these methods, when they prescribe, here's a certain way of working, here's what we declare to be a best practice, it may or may not work for you. It may or may not be the best thing for you to do <laughs> in your situation. Um, so I would rather give you choice, um, let you choose. You know what your situation is. You're the one that's best suited to choose for you. So that way you can have a fit for purpose approach. So there's strategies in there that enable you to explore requirements better. We also explicitly include uh, strategies to build quality in from the very beginning. Um, how, do you, how do you explore the non-functional, the quality of service requirements 
for your, uh, you know, for what it is that you're building. And, you know, well, first of all, what issues should you, you know, this uh, chart here is showing the types of issues that you might, you know, the views and concerns that you might want to um, address, some of which are oriented towards data or data aspects um, and other, many other aspects as well. Um, and then, of course, how do you actually capture them and, and, and act on them later on? So this is an important issue. So in the DA toolkit, we give you strategies for doing um, exactly that. So by improving your approach to requirements, you reduce the chance of being in that bottom right corner is what we're getting at. Because if you have misunderstood or missed requirements, then it often leads to, you know, you, you built something, but you built the wrong thing uh, or you built it wrong and uh, now you got to fix it, right? So you got to, you know, build a new version, you know, or, you know, uh, fix whatever problems uh, we injected because we didn't understand what we needed to build to begin with. Um, so be a little bit smarter about your requirements approach. Similarly, you want to be a little bit smarter about your approach to architecture. Uh, so this is the identify architecture process goal. Um, there's many techniques in there for, uh, for addressing data architecture and other aspects of your architecture. I should also mention that um, I've uploaded a PDF of these slides to the website, so you, you don't need to be madly writing these things down. Um, and, and of course, um, all this stuff is freely, you know, all you know, these charts and the details behind them are, are freely available in, uh, at PMI.org. So a bit of architecture modeling up front and uh, followed by you know, evolutionary design and evolutionary architecture strategies throughout uh, the rest of construction um, can avoid a lot of future rework. Do a little bit of thinking and you'll avoid a lot of problems. In DA, we also suggest you have an architecture owner. So just like you have a pro you might have a product owner on your team that's responsible for representing the, you know, the stakeholders and the customers and what they want and, and be responsible for the, you know, what needs to be built. The architecture owner leads the team in, in how to build it and helps you, you know, they tend to be a, a senior person, you know, with architecture skills, of course, uh, that can lead the team through important architecture decisions. So because of that, because of because we promote the idea that you really do want to have explicit architecture um, uh, efforts within your teams, um, you can this leads to avoiding technical debt and you'll have less to re, you know, you'll have less debt to remove because you injected less debt to begin with. Um, so having somebody on your team with architecture skills is probably a very good thing. So when you improve your approach to architecture, that addresses challenges that you would have had that would have landed you in the first uh, the 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 two left quadrants as we see here, uh, because we're building better solutions to begin with. Higher quality, you know, we're starting by building better quality things to begin with. So we're we avoid the technical debt. One of the principles uh, of Discipline Agile is to be enterprise aware, to look at the bigger picture. It's not just about your team. So one of the great things about Agile is that it made it clear that software development is a team sport. But what it doesn't make clear is that your teams are not autonomous. This is a fantasy. This is one of the great myths of the Agile community. At best, your teams are semi-autonomous. And the fact is that you need to collaborate with others to get the job done. But also, you need to recognize that whatever it is that your team is doing, it's part of your overall organizational ecosystem and the overall uh, ecosystem of the world. And you really need to be aware of how your stuff fits in with the rest of the organization. You want to be following common conventions. You want to be uh, working to common roadmaps. Um, so that way you're not building something that somebody else has already built or is in the process of building. Right. So uh, one of the reasons why, you know, one of the sources of technical debt, is that you keep building the same thing over and over and over again. Or like, you know, your team builds it, some other team builds it, some other team builds a version of it and so on. Um, that's just wasteful. So we can be a little bit smarter about this if we choose to. Or you'll build something in a different way. You, you, you know, your, your stuff might be really high quality, and, but the team down the hall, they're building something really high quality too, but they're following different standards and different conventions. So together, it's a mess. It's a mess. And for those of you who have ever had to um, maintain and update the code written by multiple people over time, you've seen this. This is a source of technical debt. You know, this person had really good style at some point, this other person, another really good style and so on. But to, individually, it was great stuff. 
but together, no good, right? We have to choose to be a little more mature in the way that we work. And part of that is to become enterprise aware. We should also work closely with our enterprise architecture team if we have one in our organization. If not, we should probably consider getting one or you know, building one. Uh, so we're gonna have a collaborative lightweight approach um, to this. So the architecture owners on, on my team will work, uh, will be part of the, uh, the enterprise architecture team um, or the divisional or the, the value stream architecture team, depending on you know, uh, how you're organized. And, but the thing is, <laughs> is that the architecture owners are collaborating with, either, with each other, probably with some leadership, of course, um, to facilitate these conversations, to share ideas, to develop common standards and common roadmaps and common artifacts that they can share so, um, with their team. So that way um, they work more effectively together and they avoid technical debt. Um, so we have a, a, uh, one of the process blades, um, which we saw earlier is enterprise architecture. We have explicit support for agile and lean enterprise architecture within an organization. This is absolutely critical to your success. If you don't have a decent enterprise architecture strategy, uh, you're, you will always have technical debt problems in your organization. Um, you need some sort of commonality, some sort of mechanism to um, deal with common technical issues and once again, to avoid technical debt. We want to, we want to follow organizational guidelines like common coding conventions, data conventions, security conventions, UI conventions, and so on. Uh, so this is this is you know probably one of the easier ways to avoid technical debt is just to grow up and have some. And I, I, I use this term on purpose: grow up, um, have some common uh, conventions. Uh, it's actually interesting for those of you who have been around for a while. Extreme programming. One of the few practices in extreme programming was to have coding standards because they realized even back then in the mid nineties, they realized that they needed, they, they needed the only way they could be successful and avoid tech, at least code level technical debt was to, to follow a common set of conventions. Makes life a heck of a lot easier for everybody. Um, so go for it. So by following common conventions, we can avoid problems that would have landed us in the bottom right corner. Um, so, and we need to, and, uh, and being enterprise aware, we really do want to, you know, understand and appreciate the big picture and yeah, it might, it's, con it can be inconvenient following coding conventions and data conventions, security conventions. Um, but we need to do it. And, you know, if your problem is, well, I don't agree with the coding conventions well, or the data conventions, we'll work with the people who are responsible for them to improve them, step up and, you know, pay down that tech. That's a form of technical debt. Um, you know, inappropriate um, conventions are a form of technical debt. So pay that down. And then, of course, we have reuse. So how are we managing the assets within an organization? Uh, the more that we can reuse, the less technical debt we'll inject. And things that are reused, <coughs> excuse me, things that are reused tend to be higher quality and they tend to be invested in because if something's being used over and over and over again, and there's a technical debt issue with it, you're highly motivated to fix that debt uh, because if something's you know, been used in 10 different systems and you've got a quality problem with it, you have a huge impact by, you know, by focusing on that quality problem, you have a huge impact on you know, multiple systems all at once. Um, so things that are reused tend to be higher quality, things that are uh, higher quality tend to get reused. Um, so it's a, a, a virtuous cycle there. So greater levels of reuse address challenges in the top left quadrant. So this is some stats from uh, six or seven years ago now, or I guess about six years ago, uh, but still pretty valid. So uh, I suspect, I should actually rerun re this study again, but uh, I suspect um, things haven't changed much. <laughs> so, you know, we do see team, agile teams doing like, um, you know, lightweight upfront architecture. We do see teams working with enterprise architects. I hope things have improved, but I suspect not. Um, you know, we, because I haven't seen movement in other similar things. Um, you know, some teams are including architects or some sort of architecture owner. So, um, you know, we're seeing, you know, we're seeing progress, but there's significant room for improvement. But like I said, uh, maybe soon I'll, I'll uh, rework this study. 
So how do we go about fixing data technical debt? So many people think that evolving a, a database, like a production database, right? You know, like your, your, your production Oracle database is difficult. And the reason why is one of, is because of coupling. You know, so a given database could be accessed by hundreds of systems within your organization, or maybe even thousands. You know, the, the corporate customer database uh, could be accessed by hundreds of things. So they're, they're highly coupled. And because of that coupling, if you make a change in the database, you could break 100 applications. So for example, if you had to change the name of a column, you know, in your customer table, in your, in your, your primary database, and if I was to ask most of you to, you know, I want to change the name of a column in your customer, in your customer table, in your production database, and I want to roll that change today. All I want to do is rename a column. Absolutely trivial. That is a trivial thing, or it should be. Is your organization, organization capable of achieving a trivial task? Most organizations can't do it. They'd be afraid because they know, well, if we rename the column, we'd break 100 applications. That's false. Um, here's how you do it. So there's a technique called database refactoring. Um, the, and what you do is, so it's basically just like with code, code refactor. Um, how do you ev safely evolve code? Well, you refactor the code. How do you safely evolve the database? You refactor it. You make small, simple changes one at a time, safe changes. The challenge is, is the data. You can't break the data, right? You can't do it. Or well, you could do it, but people don't like it if you break 100 applications. So you have to safely make these changes. So here's how you do it. So earlier, I talked about the absolutely trivial task of renaming a column in a customer database. So here we have, currently we have uh, customer first names stored in the F name column. And that's just a bad name, right? It's not clear what the name is. And for some reason, this is a serious problem for us and we want to fix it. So the idea here is that if you can't accomplish trivial things, you have no hope of accomplishing things that are actually valuable. Um, so anyways, here's how you would rename the column. We add the new column name, first name, and then we put a trigger in place to keep them synchronized. And we deploy that to production. So now we have this interim schema running where with the F name column and the first name column. So if F name is updated, then first name gets the same update and vice versa. Then we tell the application teams that stop using F name, start using first name, rework your code. And it might take them months or even years. But at the point in time where we have the first name column in place, it's effectively renamed. Now, yes, we have this overhead of having the old cruft F name and the synchronized first name uh, trigger in place. But over time, once the code, once the application teams have refactored, their stuff and they're no longer accessing F name, then we can remove the old, uh, the old cruft and the refactoring is finalized. Now, as your teams get better, as they become more agile, you'll, you'll, your uh, deprecation period, that interim schema will be in place, you know, for, you know, at the beginning, maybe for years in large organizations, but you'll be able to get it down to months or even weeks as teams get better at uh, evolution and development and being able to uh, put um, develop changes and put them in place and, and roll them out the door. So this is how you refactor, you know, and this is obviously a, a trivial thing, but all the other refactoring. So the, in the book, Refactoring Databases, uh, written by myself and Promo Sanilage, we provide uh, 60, I think it's 65 database refactorings and show how to implement them. So it's not, this is not theoretical at all. Um, we show you how to code the changes. Uh, now there's refactoring tools, it's better than coding, but absolute worst case, if you can type in code from a book, you can do database refactoring. It really is that trivial. Now, of course, to support this, just like you have to support code refactoring, you need to have a regression test suite in place for your database, because I need to be able to make a change and then run a test suite to make sure I haven't broken anything and, or, or to identify what I did break so that way I can go and fix it. So we need to adopt regression testing uh, techniques in the data world as well. Um, and why wouldn't you? If, if, your data, if you consider data an, act, an asset, 
shouldn't you test it? Shouldn't you do what you need to do to make sure it's a quality asset, which includes testing, right? So we should have automated regression test suites for our database, just like we have them for our applications. Pretty basic, right? Well, sometimes easier said than done. We also have the issue, finally, and I'll uh, just about to wrap up, of sometimes we choose to accept technical debt. That's the real message of the technical debt quadrant. When does it make sense to explicitly and intelligently accept technical debt? And that's what the green part, the top right corner is all about. Um, let's be smart about this because sometimes it makes sense to have technical debt um, for various reasons. This is from a, a recent survey that we did at PMI. Um, and in the study, we uh, explored a bunch of things, including a bunch of aspects about technical debt, including data technical debt. And interestingly enough, one of the questions that we asked was, um, you know, is, is technical debt being taken on intentionally? Intentionally, like, are, you, are you operating in that top right corner? like Martin Fowler suggests you do? And the answer is, uh, well, only about a quarter <laughs> seem to be. Uh, everybody else is either iffy or very clearly uh, no. So uh, we have some opportunity in our organizations to improve the way that we uh, deal with technical debt. So to explicitly te you know, accept technical debt, you need to understand the implications of it. You need to understand the impact. Um, you need to have a coherent reason to take on that those future costs, and you need to uh, you know you need to be willing to actually address it at some point in the future, um, because the tech, the debt will build up and the debt will eventually choke you out and kill you. So you really want to be smart about taking on new technical debt. So do it for good reasons, um, and there are good reasons to do so. Um, time to market, for example, can be one, um, but you need to be smart about it. So why is this hard? Why is all this technical debt so hard? And why, you know, after, you know, 25 years, why are we still talking about it? Why are, very clearly, have we not solved this problem? Well, unfortunately, business often doesn't understand technical debt. I'm going to share some stats on this from that, uh, that study I just uh, shared. Because um, business wants new functionality. They don't, they don't understand technical debt. They often don't understand it. Sometimes they do, but they often don't. And they often don't understand the trade-offs that they're making because they're focused on, on time and on budget. Um, so there's a lot of short-term tactical thinking and not a lot of long-term strategic thinking. And technical debt is a long-term strategic issue. You need to think strategically and act strategically. So this is also from that, uh, uh, that recent study. So one of, the, one, of the, one of the sets of questions we asked was we gave four... Um, uh, four concerns, you know, delivering on time, adding new functionality, being on or under budget, and addressing technical debt. And then we ask people, you know, tell us what your number one priority is, your number two priority, your number three, and number four. So as you can see here, addressing technical debt was the number one priority of only 3% of the respondents to the survey. And we had managers responding, we had uh, in, uh, technical people responding, and we had executives responding, so a very wide range of people. So in their organization, it was perceived that addressing technical debt was only 3% of organizations had that as a number one issue. Delivering on time uh, was number one uh, for the majority, as you can see. Now, the, for number, uh, the least important priority in uh, organizations, we're seeing that two-thirds of organizations had addressing technical debt as their lowest priority. So I think this um, provides pretty good insight into why we still have technical debt challenges after all of these years. It's because in practice for all the, you know, for all the yapping and all the rhetoric that the technical people, including myself, um, talk about the evils of technical debt, we're not being listened to. The organizations are not behaving properly. Uh, they're not behaving in a mature manner. Um, so this is so we need this is a cultural challenge. We need to address this. Um, we need to do better. So as we all know, what gets measured gets improved. Um, hope usually. Um, so seventy eight percent of organizations measure code related technical debt. So that's not not bad. But only thirty percent or thirty six percent, I should say, are measuring data or database technical debt. So 
we have a bit of a blind spot here on the data side of things, as usual, <laughs> as usual. Um, and it's just because we haven't surfaced uh, these challenges, even though it's a three, $3 trillion a year problem for the United States, um, only a third of organizations are measuring this stuff. It's, that's a bit problematic in my mind. So addressing technical debt requires a culture change. We need, you know, we need to make it part of our culture. We need to educate people. We need to communicate this over and over and over again. This will be a, a generational, it has been a generation. Uh, we didn't get it done. It's gonna take at least another, another generation, maybe even two or three um, in order to address, uh, to actually uh, build uh, you know, a culture that appreciates technical debt and hopefully avoids it. So um, in part, uh, just to uh, wrap things up before we go to Q&A, um, PMI is a, if you don't know who we are, we're a, a not-for-profit organization. Our, our goal is to help uh, people to learn, to enable people to learn and to improve and get better and to become change makers, to actually do better at what they do and to be successful in their careers. Um, it's one of the reasons why we joined with PMI. Um, so in DA, we have uh, four certifications for, or, or training programs. And you know, if you wanna get certified, you know, there's training and there's certification, you might not wanna get certified, um, that's your business. Uh, but we have uh, you know, a, a DA Scrum Master, um, and it goes far beyond Scrum. This is gonna get renamed. This is not the right name for it. Um, but it teaches you how to improve at the team level and at the, um, uh, at the individual level. The senior scrum master, sir, is really about all about being a team coach. It's all about, you know, how do we lead improvement at the team level? And um, yesterday, Mark Lines and I had a great talk on uh, continuous improvement and how to do it properly and how to, how to do it effectively. So moving beyond failing fast. Um, failing fast is a fail, by the way. Um, this is a fad that is, that, um, is not treating the, the Agile community well. Um, anyways. Uh, my prediction: two or three years from now, will you know many of the speakers will be you know, presenting their version of how to how to avoid failing fast. Um, it's still failure. Uh, DA coach is all about leading improvement across disparate teams. This is more of a senior coaching cert. So how do we coach beyond IT? You know how do we how do we help uh, multiple teams that are collaborating together improve? And of course, here's the value stream consultant. How do we improve across the organization across our value streams? How do we become more effective at bringing products and services to market? So anyways, um, hope I've got a minute or two, a uh, bit of time for questions. Yeah, um, thanks, Scott, for those wonderful insights. So uh, we have a question that when we have the speed to market, need to minimize the time. So any suggestion on how can we manage all these? Well, yeah, you're making choices, right? So that's the, that's the entire uh, issue is that you're making trade-offs. And do you, are you making intelligent trade-offs? Do you understand the implications of what you're doing? So when you are aiming for time to market or you know, being on time, being on budget type stuff, um, you almost always sacrifice quality. You take shortcuts. And sometimes that makes sense. That's, that's what the top right quadrant is all about in, in Martin Fowler's technical debt um, quadrant. The, so if you're making intelligent decisions and understand the implications of what you're doing, then that's fine, right? But if you're not, like if quality is being shortchanged in order to hit a date um, and you don't understand that, then you're not doing a good job. Then you're in one of the other quadrants and you're, ta you're recklessly taking on or imprudently taking on technical debt. Um, and then that, that just harm, that just harms you. So, um, yeah, that's it. So make intelligent trade-offs. That's the entire message. Um, and if you don't understand the trade-offs you're making, you might not, you might want to stop making decisions until you do. Um, but you know, easier said than done. Yeah. So Scott, uh, we have one more minute and I think I'll just take this last question. So what are some of the tools to measure data technical depth in SQL databases? Yeah, you'd have to do a Google search on that. It, it depends on the platform, of course. Um, there's some great stuff from uh, uh, Redgate, but I, I'm not going to I'm going to I'm not going to name tools because it changes constantly. A lot of people actually hand jam their tools. Um, the data world, um, the the data community is not well served by tool vendors. Like, there's great tools, but 
nowhere near as many great tools per capita as what you see for software developers um, for many reasons, you know, cultural reasons and lack of skill reasons and stuff like that. But, uh, but there are, there are great tools, but you need, you would need to go and search that for whatever your platform is. Um, Cause there's many different database platforms as we know. Yeah. And just to share, Scott, we are getting a uh, couple of comments regarding thanks for your appreci appreciating the highlighting that technical depths needs a cultural change. Thanks, Scott. Thank you.